In this video, we're going to be covering how to paint an object in 3D. So let's just drop in a cube and just quick review. We already went over going to this UV edit tab, having these UVs however we want them, do something like that. And then again, lists, UV maps, texture right here. This is our UVs and it's just named texture. I can name this whatever I want. And if I want to get this out to Photoshop to put paint on it, I can go do texture, export UV to EPS right here. And then I can open that up in Photoshop. And if I was going to make, let's say, a die for a board game, I could make the numbers in each one of these corresponding squares and then make a background layer for that, fill it with white, and then essentially I'd have a die. So what I want to do is actually just be able to look at this cube and actually just paint right on this cube in 3D as opposed to looking at this 2D representation. So again, I'm starting with just this basic cube. This is my unwrap. Again, it has to have an unwrap to paint on it. And what I'm going to do is just go up to this tab up top called paint. Again, if you don't see these tabs up here, you have layout, layouts, and then just choose that paint tab. So this paint tab is going to look a little bit different. There's some stuff going on down here. Um, menus on their left and right should look pretty similar, except for over here we just have some new stuff. So here's little sub menu. So let's pop this open a little bit bigger so we can read all these. So we have sculpting tools up here. We're not going to be doing those. Painting tools. This is what we're going to focus on. Hair tools. Bunch of miscellaneous stuff down here. But again, we're going to be focusing on these paint tools. Let's go to our items tab so we can just see. So again, we have this mesh. Let's just rename him cube real quick. He has the unwrap. And we're just looking in this viewport. So I'm just going to go to this airbrush tool. And I'm not going to go into any technical stuff just yet. And we'll just start painting on this. So if I try to click and drag on this, you'll see that your mouse kind of locks up. It did a little bit of stuff behind the scenes. So now if I go to click and drag on this again, it's letting me paint in this white color. So again, I have my brush size, just like in Photoshop, so I can change that in kind of two different locations. So if I right click and drag left and right, you're going to see that little red guy getting bigger and smaller. That's just letting me change my brush size. So it can be huge, it can be small, whatever size I want. But also down over here, again, this is going to be our airbrush tool is active, and these are the properties for that air airbrush tool. So over here I have size 53, so let's pop that down to 20, and I get a stroke that's that wide. Let's pop it up to something like 80, and I get a stroke that's that wide. So again, not anything too crazy, just changing your brush size. So one kind of weird thing with the brush size, let's get a smaller brush size. So if I come out and I make a stroke on this, it's brush is this wide, but then if I zoom in, and I do a brush stroke, you're going to see that my brush got smaller. If I zoom way out and do that brush stroke, it's going to be even wider. I never changed my brush size. It was always at this size 20. But depending on if I zoomed in and out, that brush size was staying the same size on my screen. So that can be kind of confusing. So if that's something you don't like, let's rotate over. Huh, I'll just undo it so those aren't on there anymore. Um, if you don't like that and you want your kind of size of your brush to stay the same no matter how far you're zoomed in or out, you have this little checkbox down here called Auto Scale, and that's right by Size. So now if I turn that on, left click, drag down, brush size is 20, zoom out, brush size is the same width, and I'll zoom way in, and brush size is the same width. So again, it's giving me some consistencies, but again, we don't have a brush stroke that's now this wide this wide, and then this wide, depending on how much I'm zoomed in. It's a little bit more consistent. So I'm going to do a few times, get this back to a clean cube. And the next thing that I wanted to go over, let's just get some kind of color on here, is this little value right here, and this is opacity. So if you're using a tablet, again, it's going to be kind of pressure sensitive for opacity. So if you do a light stroke, let's go up to the top, do a light stroke, it's going to fill that in with a lighter amount. If I do a heavy stroke, it's going to fill that in a little bit more. But again, your opacity is over here, so if I knock this down to 10%, even if I do a bigger stroke, you're seeing a not a lot. I can go back and forth on that thing quite a bit. Um, not a lot of paint is kind of getting thrown down. But again, if I pop this up to 100, do the same thing, I get a really, really dense stroke. So again, if you do have a tablet that's going to 
help you out as far as pressure sensitivity goes because again if you want to lay a lot of color down you can do a heavier stroke if you want to just put little bits of color you can do lighter strokes and get those in so again just another reason if you have a Cintiq if you have a Wacom tablet um, those are just going to be really really helpful for you the next thing would be the color so again this thing is coming in as white that's kind of our default color so over here again in our properties thing we have FG color and it has these values so it has a 1, a 1, and a 1 those just correlate to RGB so if I click one of these and drag it left and right it'll change that value or I can just left click on this and I get a more familiar color wheel that I can kind of zoom around pick the color that I want change how light or dark it is but you might also notice over here we have the same color wheel so again I can go over to red make it a little bit darker change my brush size and then I have red that I'm kind of laying down and then just some other options Let's click on this color wheel again over here we have our color model so we got this little default one and then we have this Kelvin one so again it's as I move this guy left and right up and down I can color pick and then I have these swatches over here this is just kind of a different way of picking go down to this RGB one again this one's gonna be a little bit different it's just your personal preference on how you like to color pick so we'll just set it back to the default this is the one that most people usually stay on as far as moto goes but again we'll go back to that red color somewhere in there and again you don't have to click over here every time you can go over here as well and click to select any color that you want so one other thing I wanted to note real quick just so it because it might be potentially confusing go to our airbrush again real quick you have this FG color and this BG color so FG is the foreground color let's click on that BG is the background color kind of like in Photoshop so um, usually it's a little bit easier you don't have to worry about as much stuff if you just grab this background color either leave it to all white or all black it doesn't really matter um, but again if you like putting in your values one at a time I can just turn all these to one background color goes to white but again you can switch back and forth between these by go ahead and turn them back on hitting this little arrow right here that does the swap back and forth and again that same arrows down here that you can swap those colors back and forth as well so if you're kind of working back and forth with two different colors sometimes that can be helpful and saying the last thing that I wanted to kind of point out again we're still in the airbrush tool is this little guy right here let's make this window bigger it's called um, interpolation step you can just think of just call it step for short so right now it's at 5% so if I look at my brush stroke zoom up a little bit do a stroke it gives me a pretty smooth stroke so let's undo that so this the step let's take this up to something like 50 Oop, not 500 that'd be bad there we go now let's go ahead and make a stroke and see how this differs so now you can see that it gives me a bunch of little dots so let's undo that crank this up to something like 90 do the same thing now kind of the distance between these dots is greater so again I can keep making that go up higher and higher but again it's just going to keep increasing the distance between these dots it defaults at 5% you can make it lower if you want but normally 5% gives you a smooth stroke without having to worry about oops I changed the opacity let's pop that back up we'll just do 100 and take this interpolation step. This guy's normally defaulted at 5. So again, with this guy at 5%, click and drag, it gives you a really smooth stroke. So if you've worked in anything like ZBrush, you're probably familiar with how this works. But again, um, just one more setting you guys might want to mess with a little bit. So next one down, look at this little guy. So we're, we were on the airbrush. Now we're going to jump to the paintbrush. And default settings, do a little stroke. So you'll notice this one's a little bit darker, but there's one other kind of big thing that is different between these. So what I'm going to do is just put down a red stroke with the paintbrush, switch to the airbrush, put down a stroke. I'm going to go switch my color to a blue color, come back over, paintbrush on top of paintbrush, do a line across. You see that the blue just over red, red over road, <laughs> the... Uh, red here go to the airbrush do the same thing and you're going to see this you're going to kind of still see the red underneath so these two are going to play with each other a little bit what better so just like in um, normal mixing of color red and blue together kind of make this purple color 
So again, that's just the main difference of how these two behave. But again, you can definitely have independent settings with each of them and take advantage of that, not even including the blending. Because again, they all have, if I go back and forth between these, paying attention down here, they have the exact same settings going back and forth. Big difference being how the two blend together when you kind of do one stroke over top of another stroke. So on the topic of kind of mixing colors together, the next thing I wanted to look at is kind of skip ahead a little bit and look at these smudge and blur tools. So the smudge works kind of similar to how it would in Photoshop. I can just grab, pull this blue out into this empty area, pull this red over here, and then kind of mix these together, swir swirl them around, and it kind of mixes those as it would paint. And same thing over here. And again, we're getting a little bit of weird stuff going on right here, and I'll explain kind of what's happening there in a little bit. Other one being this blur tool, that's going to do exactly what you'd expect, just kind of blurs these colors out, mixes them together a little bit, and again you have your opacity here so you can kind of reduce that, increase that, do whatever you need to get kind of the look you're going for. So this next one I wanted to go over, and again I won't go over all these, um, let's do the erase one real quick. This one is going to do pretty much exactly what you think it's going to do. It's just going to come in here and erase what's going on here. So again, it just has no color underneath. Um, again, there's a few settings over here, but that one's pretty self-explanatory how it works. But the next thing I wanted to look at, and this is going to behave kind of strange, is this fill color. It doesn't normally behave how you would expect it to. So we have our fill color. We have some blue on here. We have some red on here. So let's just grab a new color. Let's grab a green. And let's just click on this object to fill it. So, as you can see, it acted a little bit weird there. Let's click over here, where we weren't painting, and we get this result. So, okay, let's undo that real quick. I forgot since I was painting right here, there's a little bit of pixels where I didn't quite erase everything. So, just go to a blank side, click on that. Oops, we uh, are on our erase, not our fill, so switch back to that fill. When I hit undo it, switch back to the other tool. Fill this, now we get it with green, but then you'll see these weird little cloudy areas around where my strokes were, and then this really weird area here, and then kind of this. That again, when we were smudging those, we were kind of getting kind of weird things. So what happens with this, let's undo real quick. If I look at this polygon, it's filled in with gray. But actually what's happening is there's, if I was to look at kind of this image that we were creating, it wouldn't have gray pixels all in this area. It would have no pixels. It would be an empty area, sometimes referred to as an alpha. So again, when I hit this fill, what it's doing is it's seeing all this is empty area going over here. As soon as it hits this, it sees it and then it stops at that gradient because again, there's different levels of opacity of pixels here. So it just goes right up to those edges and it stops. So again, it ends up looking kind of weird on this end. So just to show you what's going on, we're just going to jump into Photoshop, File New, grab a new image. So normally when I open a Photoshop document, it's going to have this little layer called background. This is filled with white. So again, if I paint on it, I'm painting blue on top of white. Let's actually double click this layer so it's not locked anymore. Now what I'm going to do is hit New Layer and just delete this background one. Oops. Don't want layer styles, so delete that. So now we have an empty layer. So this is showing up as empty or alpha, and it's displaying this by, if you can see it, it has a little checker pattern everywhere. And that's just to let you know, hey, this is a blank layer. You have no pixels here. So let's go ahead, switch to a red color, do a little stroke, fill it in really um, saturated right there. And let's... Instead of making a new layer, I just want to stay on this layer. And let's jump to the Paint Bucket tool, switch to a blue, and then fill this background area where there's no pixels. As soon as they come to where there's any opacity of pixels, it's going to stop. So again, you have this tolerance up here in Photoshop, if you're familiar with it, that you can kind of adjust to try to fill in this area. If I try to fill in this red, for example, it's going to try to fill in the majority of the red, depending on, again, this tolerance. If I drop this tolerance, it's going to fill it in a different manner as opposed to if this tolerance is higher. But regardless, you can see that's what it's doing, why it's getting that weird look to it. 
is it's again filling in no pixels and then stopping when it starts to hit a color. So again, it might look like it's doing something wrong, but it's behaving as intended. So let's kind of go over some best practices here. So let's just clear this out and start with a new scene. So I'm in a completely new scene. You can see it's empty over here. We have no geometry in it. So let's hold down the control key, click on the cube. We get a cube in our existing mesh. And from here, we're going to do again the best practices I was just talking about. So again, let's say that our goal was to model a cube. So whatever you're modeling, you get that model completely done. We have our finished beautiful cube. We'll call it good. Now what we need to do is UV unwrap that. So again, nothing new. Go over to the UV edit tab. Go over here. We can cut it up however we want. Unwrap, right click. Now we have our unwrap. We position this guy into place. Scale it down so it fits. And say, okay, now we have a good unwrap. So from here, what we want to do, again, we just have our items over here. We just have a mesh. So let's just name this cube. Go over to our shading tree. We don't have any materials assigned to this. So even if I'm not going to change any settings, I want this cube to have a material on it. So let's double click, grab all of its polygons, hit M for material or texture, assign material to group, which is also the M key. Name this. We'll just name it the same thing, but add an underscore material at the end of it. So over here we get this box material. Here's its material. And now, in a sense, we're a little bit closer to being ready to paint. So before, like with the other assignments, we would apply a texture to something. It would give it color. So that texture was a separate image from our 3D file. So if we look over here, this is where that's going to end up being, is again, you drag and drop that texture between kind of this name of the material and the material that would go in just right there. But it's also going to be located on this images tab. So right here we have no images in here. We have no kind of um, image inside of this material here. So again, just note that both of these are empty. So let's go over to the paint tab real quick. Keep this images guy open. Now I'm going to click airbrush and I'm going to click on my mesh. And remember before when we did this, as soon as we clicked, it froze up. And it did some stuff behind the scenes that I told you I was going to explain, so I'm doing that now. So again, click and drag. It kind of locks up. So over here you can see it just created an image called diff underscore color. Diff is short for diffuse. Normally the color image that you apply to something to make it kind of look the colors you want it to be, that's usually referred to as a diffuse texture. So texture is the type of image you throw on a 3D object. Diffuse is the type of categorized texture. So let's jump over to the shading tree. And lo and behold, we have this little image right here called diff color. That's right where we wanted to drag and drop our texture. So if I look, kind of pull this out, it's going to tell me where this little file is located. So users, my name, documents, diffuse.tga or targa. So if I open up that file structure, just have it right here. Now I have this little image called diff underscore color. So let's paint on this real quick. So we kind of have some information. Let's just put big huge red line. Let's put just a dot that's blue on every other side that I kind of didn't get to. There we go. So now we can kind of see everything that's going on with this. And if I look over here, you can see in that thumbnail, there's a little bit of red there, and then there's the little blue dots that kind of correspond. Again, it's really little and hard to see. But if I go over here and look, I have this image. So let's look at this in preview. So hit spacebar, it comes up, and you can see the red because it's kind of shining through from there. So let's move this guy out of the way so it's not influencing anything. So now hit spacebar, you can see this comes in and it's an empty image. So what that tells me is even though this has color on it, it hasn't been saved yet. So let's right click on this image. Again, we're on this image tab. Hit save. It saves. Let's go back over here and look. So grab our image, hit spacebar. Now you can see this is coming up. So we have our red here. We have our blue dots. The image is saved. So again, we haven't saved out the 3D file yet. Let's do that real quick. 
So let's just throw this right in the documents file. Call this cube underscore paint. We'll just leave it as a moto file. Hit save. So now if I look in here, I have my cube underscore paint, my 3D file. I have this color file. So just a quick note, this 3D file only has the geometry that's going on with this scene. It doesn't actually hold the color information. If I want the color information, I have to combine these two files together to make that happen. So let's just close out of this. And it says, do you want to save? So yeah, sure, why not? Hit save. So now I have cube paint. Double click him. It's going to open up the file. So lo and behold, I open it up and it has the paint on the file. So the thing, the question I get from students all the time is, I open my file and my color's not on it. I need to repaint it. And they just completely freak out and think that they lost all their work. So the reasoning behind this is because they will have these in two different locations or they will just save me out the 3D file, not save me out this image. So again, when I open this file, all I'm going to get is a 3D file that doesn't have any color to it. So let's take this and just rename it, renamed color, hit OK. So now this 3D file is going to look for that diff color that was here, but it's not there anymore because we renamed it. So now let's see what happens when we open this guy up. So now it says file not found, diff color.tga. Files not found, do you want to find one? So if I just hit no, because I don't have the file, it's on your computer somewhere, it's going to come in and it's going to look like this, completely black. I'm going to be confused, you're going to be confused. So let's go ahead, open up our shader tree. Let's make this bigger. We have this diff color, that's the empty file that it can't find. So let's right click and delete that. So now we go back to having our finished 3D model, but no color on it. So now we can go here, grab this renamed color, drag and drop it on our 3D or right here, and we're back in business. So again, just know you have to save out your 3D file, you have to save out this color file or this texture, diffuse texture, and you're good to go. So a few other things with this. Normally when I have you save out a texture, I want you guys to save out PNGs. This comes out as a targa. So let's go ahead and just start up a new scene. In this new scene, let's just go ahead Oops, let's just go to the model tab so we're not introducing too many new things. Actually, instead of throwing in a box, let's go ahead and throw in a ball instead. So going to our UV edit, this guy already comes with an unwrap on it. Going to the paint tab, images, since this is a new image or a new 3D file, it doesn't have any textures associated with it. This images file is empty. It doesn't have a material on it, so let's go through the best practices. Let's name our mesh. We'll just name this ball. Go to the shading tree. Give ball a new material. Ball underscore mat. Hit OK. Now what I want to do is I want to manually create the texture that I'm making, because the other thing that we didn't get to choose was how big was this image. So if I pull this up, what it's going to say, dimensions 2048 by 2048. So if I give you guys a specific size, you don't want Moto to determine how large your image is. You want to personally select that yourself. So to do that, what we're going to do is, again, we can be on this paint tab. Our ball has its own material. Let's go to images over here. We have this little button here called add clip. So let's left click him and we have this whole scenario stuff. And what we want is a new image. So go down to new image, click on him. So this is saying, what is the name of this new image? So we'll call this ball underscore diff texture. Now it's where's the location that we want it. I'll just throw it on my desktop. And this is the file type. So we have a bunch of different file types. Again, I'm usually going to have you guys do PNGs. So let's click PNG. This guy. Hit save. Now it's going to say what size do you want? So I'll say I want a 1024 by 1024. Um, this stuff you can just all leave for default for now. Hit OK. That guy gets added here. But the other thing you'll notice is 
it only got added here, go to the shading tree, it didn't get applied to our actual texture. We just created a new independent image that again, if I go to my desktop, it's right here, it's a big empty image, but it didn't get applied to our ball material. So what I'm going to do is pull this out, have our ball diff texture, drag it over here, plunk, now it's applied. Now I can go ahead, select my airbrush, paintbrush, whatever, pick a color, let's go with an orange. Now I can draw on this, and again, when I did that stroke, it didn't lock up at all because it wasn't creating a new texture. It was working off of this empty image that I already created. So I can come in here, fill this with orange, actually use the fill tool, do that. Again, it's going to cause this kind of wonky scenario. But again, I can just color over this, make this kind of whatever color I want. So let's go with this, switch to here, put some spots on this guy. Now I want to save out this image. So normally what I do is go to this image tab, right click and hit save here. I could also do a save as and then change where it's located. But let's say you forgot to do that. So let's go ahead and save our 3D file. So we'll just name this ball underscore paint. Throw it on the desktop. It's a moto scene. Hit save. So somewhere on my desktop right here is this ball paint file. And I never actually saved this image because again, if I go in here, click it, this guy's empty. So let's just go ahead and close moto and see what happens. Funk. So it says, do you want to save the changes to ball diff texture PNG? So it knew that I painted on this. So it's going to give me this one warning of a, hey, you changed this paint. Do you want to save it? So let's go ahead and hit save. See this guy updated. Now we have our ball. Again, this guy is going to look a little bit weird. So let's reopen this up and see the benefit of painting in 3D. So looking at this, if I go to this guy's UV edit window, Again, my textures aren't going to be selected, so again, I can just, on this list tab, UV maps, click texture. Now this is the balls unwrap. Again, this is just the default unwrap it gives for a sphere, kind of a wonky scenario. And then if I want to see the image that's associated with it, I just open this little guy for the material. Again, I'm on the shading tree, click ball diffuse texture, and it shows up over here. So again, if I just kind of think about this mentally, I have on these polygons, a couple different spots. So here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, but top and bottom, so right here and right here, there's two balls. So this one correlates to right here. Scroll down here. This one correlates to right here. So if I wanted to paint a circle on this part of the ball, obviously if we're thinking about this in Photoshop, I can just paint a circle and it's gonna show up like a circle. But if I want to paint a circle right here, it's going to go across all these crazy weird seams. So let's actually do this with a box so it's a little less confusing. Let's go ahead, drop a box in. It's going to give it this default unwrap. I'll go to the paint tool. Let's do airbrush. And again, I haven't created a texture. So under this clips tab, as soon as I click on this, a new image gets created. So let's just make a red dot right here, pink dot right here, blue dot, just kind of go around. We'll just put black on these two sides and a whitish color on these two sides. So let's go ahead and look at this unwrap. So over here, now if this, let's say this, this I was going to make a polka dotted crate or something like that, these ones are obviously our little easy areas to put dots. But the hard ones are these ones that kind of match up on the scene because technically this edge, if I zoom over here, 
is connected to this edge. So you'll see it's connected. This little area is showing up in blue. So yellow is selected. Blue is its kind of connecting edge. So if I wanted to make this dot right here in Photoshop, I'd have to do a half of a dot right here and a half of a dot right here and hope that it lined up and it wasn't shifted. So let's grab this, shift it over so you can see what I'm talking about. Oops, let's do one of these numbers so it works out a little bit better. So if I look at this now, you can see how we have kind of a hemisphere here and a hemisphere here. So these dots aren't really lined up. So when you're working and doing these textures in Photoshop, you can get weird seams. So painting in 3D kind of alleviates those seams and makes your life a lot easier. So again, if I wanted to paint across this blue surface from here to here, I could actually do something really complicated. So let's grab this, this, and this. We, again, we have a trifecta of seams here. Go to the Paint tab. Let's just grab a new color. We'll make type of brown, go back over to this desired corner, do a smaller one, let's actually do the paintbrush instead. And with this new brown color, we'll just go ahead, make a circle right here, switch to a green color, make a little dot. I don't know, let's have some stars coming out, make a very ghetto looking sun, call that good. I'm gonna go over to my UV edit tab. Now let's look at this. So again, right here, we kind of have where this came around to here, came around to here, and came around to here. So we're coming through three different areas of our texture, but looking in 3D, it came across here without any problems with the seams at all. So again, just showing how powerful it is to paint in 3D. Again, you're not going to get as many settings as you would in Photoshop, but still just the ability to paint from seam to seam to seam is going to help out quite a bit. So I definitely encourage you guys to use a combination of painting in Modo and Photoshop to kind of get the desired results you're looking for. So real quick, one more thing that I wanted to show. This could be kind of looked at as a possible troubleshooting scenario or a feature. So let's pretend like we started from a new scene. We magically modeled our model in one click. So there we go, we have a model of a guy. If I go to UV edit, I select his edges and magically now I have an unwrap. So again, that modeling and unwrapping process is gonna take quite a bit, but again, I didn't wanna show the modeling of a random thing. But so from here, what I wanna do, and again, this is just best practices. Normally I'm on this items tab. I'm going to go to Images, Add Clip, New Image. So this will just be called Man Paint. Have it be a PNG. Again, that's what I usually ask for the most. Hit Save. Now from here, I'm going to make this a 1024. Leave these other settings at default. Hit OK. It generates that map. Throws it on my desktop right here. I go to the Shading tab. He's got a material that he comes with. I'm just going to give him a new one. M for material, man paint. Click OK, grab this new man paint texture, put it in the material, go to our paint tab. And now let's start painting. So pick a color change a brush size, do a stroke, and we're painting on that newly created texture again that I just saved to the desktop. So the one other reminder, if I want to save this, right click here, hit save, it uploads. Again, we just saw this two seconds ago, but regardless, um, just one more quick review of that process. So the thing with this, this can be seen as a feature or as a potential bug, depending on how you notice it. So let's say that I want to give this guy red gloves. Let's select these polygons right here and just so we don't have to do it twice, let's turn symmetry on the X. Now grab these polygons. Now switch to the airbrush tool, change our brush size, and start filling this in. So again we're just painting and you're going to notice when I paint it stops on this polygon. So let's turn this off so we can see this. It stops right there, so let's undo this a few times. So something like that. 
and now let's do the fill tool. So again, these polygons are selected. Click again. It's seeing this as this 2D image, so it tries to fill it. So again, this technique won't work with the fill tool, but we can do the airbrush or the paintbrush, I guess. It doesn't really matter. Increase that size. And let's just paint all on his hand. Again, if I do the stroke up his arm, it's going to stop right there. So again, it's not painting on him where I don't want it to be painted on. But again, I do want to kind of zoom around this and make sure that I'm painting everywhere. So again, now he has, in a sense, red gloves. But let's say that I want to paint and give him, I don't know, a hat. So let's just grab some polygons here, see what we get for selection, something like this. So there we go. And just make sure the same ones are selected. Symmetry's on, so grab the other ones. So ideally, if I go back to this paintbrush, and if, if I wanted to do some type of fine work with this, ideally I don't want to have these polygons yellow on here. So what I'm going to do is I have these polygons selected. If I switch over here to vertices, what it's going to do is it didn't really deselect those polygons. They're just not visible over here. So again, if I go back to polygons, and again, this is only on the paint tab, these are still going to be selected in a sense. So switch to vertices, switch to my brush over here, and now I do a line, keep going, keep going, and it's, you see it stops. And it's stopping on that border that's active over here. So again, if you're if you accidentally select a number of polygons like this, for example, and then you hit the spacebar, because again, spacebar switches from vertices, edges, polygons, vertices, edges, polygons, whatever. Select a brush, and you're saying I'm trying to paint on his shoulders and no paint showing up. Probably what happens is, again, you had polygons selected somewhere, hit the spacebar, and if you're painting on the right polygons, paint will show up, but as soon as I do the stroke down, it just stops and it doesn't paint on his back. Again, same thing with the head. If we're going to do a line coming on here, it stops. So again, you could potentially see that as a bug if you're trying to paint and paint's not coming up. Chances are, again, you just have your polygons selected. But you can also use that to your advantage. Like if I wanted to give him pants, I could... Uh, let's go to the front so I'm not actually accidentally grabbing the hand. Lasso select right here. Something like that. Go back to a paintbrush. Now I do a blue color. Get a huge brush, because again, when we go out of the bounds, it's not going to actually paint on here. So get that side. Come over here, get this side. Make sure we get all the nooks and crannies. And I missed these polygons. It's not really that big of a deal. So let's just repaint on here. There we go. Now he kind of has a pair of pants going on. So again, you can definitely take advantage of that. The other thing that I kind of noticed over here, but I figured I'd point out, is right here you're seeing this, how it has this stepping. Those are actual literal pixels that are showing up. So again, not anything to be alarmed about, but just know that when you're working with stuff like this, depending on what your size is, your texture size, you might have more or less pixelated textures. So again, if I go and I just blur this, what it's going to do is kind of blur those pixels together and make it so it's not as apparent of... A transition but again nothing major at all so the next thing I want to do is let's actually just delete this material out go to the shading tree delete it out again so we're kind of starting from scratch go to the images tab make a new image and we'll call this man underscore layer one or zero one and this is a PNG hit save and we'll keep it that 1024 size. So we have that, so let's actually go ahead and make another image. So let's go ahead and find our man01. So it's right here, so just click on that just so I get the same name. So I know I'm naming it the same, and we'll just name this layer 2. So what we're going to be doing is, let's set this. So let's say you wanted to work in layers like Photoshop. So we have layer 1 and layer 2. Let's open up the shading tree. The material is already open. So let's grab layers 1 and 2 and just plunk both of these in here one at a time. So there's layer 1. There's layer oops, 2. 
too. So what I can do now is go back to that paintbrush tool and let's make it a little small. So now what I can do is use these as actual layers because again, since it's a PNG image, it'll come in with no pixel data. So adversely, something like a JPEG can't have an alpha channel or an alpha being zero pixels there. It would, um, a JPEG would actually fill the image with white, but a PNG is going to have empty pixels. So right now he has, in a sense, empty pixels everywhere on him. So I can go ahead and fill in a blue line right here. Again, symmetry's on, so we'll just do that. Now I, over here I can switch to layer two, and let's have that airbrush selected again. I'm going to just pick a different color like red, and now let's go over top of this. So again, we can have that layering effect. So now if I turn, let's deselect so we're not selecting either layer. So if I turn this one off, I can see those pixels under there. They didn't get colored over. There's just two different layers there. And again, I can also take this layer, drag it above, and it shows up above this one. So now the red layer, or layer two, is behind. So this is the way that you can do it and create multiple layers in your image. So again, technically, so if I was to save these out, save, save, let's move this over. Now we, in a sense, we have layer one and layer two, which are two separate images. So ideally, you don't want to have to have all these in a bunch of different layers. So this is where you could grab these layers, take them into Photoshop, and we'll just leave this up over here on the left so we can see what's going on. And this one, I want to move this layer into this layer, so I move, go to the Move tool. So if I left click, drag over here, I still have left click held down, now I hold the Shift key, let go of my left click, it's going to drag it and be right where it was. So again, it's not moved over here, it's not moved over here, it's right back at that origin location. So now, if I compare, let's move this over a little bit. If I compare these two images, ideally I'm going to want to have this layer, and again, these layers didn't rename. So this one right here would have been, let's just rename these real quick, man underscore layer 02. This would be the same thing, but with an 01 instead of a 02. So now I can manipulate these in Photoshop, do a save as, save this out as a PSD, have a working PSD that I could go in and modify, and then when you turned in your final texture, what you'd want to do is have the PNG with the multiple layers combined in it, so something like this. So I'll just name this man underscore diff for diffuse underscore final or something like that. And then end it in the dot PNG, save to the desktop, hit save, say OK. And now I would have a working PSD somewhere and then a final texture that looks like this guy.